McKinsey and Company is considered to be one of the most prestigious business consulting firms in the world. Whenever CEOs of large companies face a problem they don't know how to solve, they'll hire consultants from McKinsey to figure it out. They're the smartest guys in the room. But in 1991, McKinsey itself was facing a problem they couldn't quite figure out how to solve. McKinsey operated its own pension fund for its employees. Employees contributed a portion of their paychecks into the fund for investment. Instead of buying stocks or bonds directly, the McKinsey pension fund invested in third-party hedge funds. One of McKinsey's employees was reviewing the performance of the funds, and one of them caught his attention. The returns were very good. In fact, they seemed almost too good. The fund in question increased in value by 1-2% per month without fail. This equated to roughly 20% annualized returns. While a 20% return isn't quite unbelievable by itself, the more puzzling thing was the almost complete lack of volatility. When you put the returns on a chart, it almost looks like a straight line up and to the right. The McKinsey employee had a feeling that something was wrong, but couldn't quite figure it out. After all, he was a business consultant, not a financier. So what do consultants do when they can't figure out a problem? They hire another consultant, of course. They hired a man named Dr. Edward Thorpe. Thorpe was a former mathematics professor, professional gambler, and previously ran a quantitative hedge fund. If anyone could figure out what was going on, it was him. He reviewed the documents and within just a few weeks, realized that this fund was a Ponzi scheme. The name of the fund was Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities. In 1991, Edward Thorpe found out that Madoff was running a Ponzi scheme. But over the next 17 years, Madoff would continue to raise tens of billions of dollars from new investors before the scheme finally collapsed in 2008. In this video, we'll look at how Edward Thorpe exposed Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme almost two decades before its collapse, and why so few people listen to his warnings. In addition to being one of the biggest fraudsters of all time, Bernie Madoff also suffered from male pattern baldness. And he's not alone. 30-50% to 50 of men suffer from balding by the age of 50. Fortunately, treating baldness has never been easier thanks to today's video sponsor, Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that delivers clinically proven treatments to address hair loss and boost hair growth. They set you up with a licensed medical provider to make a treatment plan personalized for you. Hair loss can be a deeply personal issue, so once your treatment is set, they'll deliver it discreetly to your door in non-branded packaging. They offer FDA-approved hair loss treatment options, which are clinically proven to work, and they've already helped nearly 1 million men keep their hair. According to clinical studies, treatments offered by Keeps are 90% effective at treating hair loss and can increase your hair growth by up to 35%. Most Keeps consumers notice results within 6 months. In addition to clinically proven treatments, Keeps also offers hair thickening shampoo, conditioner, and styling pomade. Keeps is effective and affordable, typically costing half of traditional pharmacy prices. Hair loss stops with Keeps. For a special offer to get started, go to keeps.com slash wallstreetmillennial or click the link in the description below. That's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash wallstreetmillennial. And now back to the video. One of the reasons it took so long for Madoff to be exposed is because in addition to running a Ponzi scheme, he also ran a legitimate market making business. He founded Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities in 1960. For the first decade or so, it was completely legitimate. So what did they do? Today, executing a stock trade is pretty easy. You just go on your phone, open up your brokerage app, and press buy or sell. Back in the 1960s, it was much more difficult. You would have to call your stockbroker and tell him what stocks you want to trade. The broker would then look at his own records to see if he happened to own any of these stocks he wanted to buy. If not, the broker has to call around other brokers until he finds one who's willing to sell the relevant shares. This was a slow, tedious, and expensive process. These brokers are also called market makers because they create a market for their clients to buy and sell stocks. In the 1970s, Madoff was one of the first stockbrokers to use a computer-based quotation system. He got together with a few other brokers and they connected their computers over telephone lines. This allowed them to create a shared dashboard. Each broker would list their inventory of stocks as well as what prices they'd be willing to buy or sell them for. If a broker receives an order from a client who wants to buy a stock, he just has to look at the dashboard and see who has the stock in their inventory and buy it from them. At this point, the actual trades were still done over the telephone. But the ability to see who owns that stock instantaneously on the dashboard was a huge improvement. This system of electronic stock price quotations eventually turned into the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotations, or NASDAQ for short. It was initially created by the National Association of Securities Dealers, a non-profit self-regulatory body which is the predecessor of FINRA. Bernie Madoff was a member of the National Association of Securities Dealers and briefly served as its chairman. The NASDAQ started off as a non-profit entity, meant to provide a service to stockbrokers. 
It eventually turned into a for-profit company in the early 2000s. Madoff never owned an equity stake in the Nasdaq, but his early adoption of electronic stock price quotations, as well as his involvement with the National Association of Securities Dealers, gave him a huge amount of credibility in the industry. Madoff's market-making business was highly successful. It's estimated to have generated millions of dollars per year, and up until the end, it was completely legitimate. But this wasn't enough. Madoff wouldn't settle for millions. He wanted billions. At some point in the 1970s, he expanded his company to also offer an investment fund. Leveraging the experience he gained over the years as a market maker, Madoff claimed that he had developed a quantitative options trading strategy which could consistently produce high returns with low risk. At the crux of the strategy was so-called options callers. He would buy shares of a stock, sell a call option slightly above the current price, and use the proceeds from the sale to buy a put option slightly below the stock price. If the stock price increases or decreases a little bit, neither of the options are executed. But both your upside and your downside are capped. So you won't make huge losses or huge gains. In most cases, investors didn't invest directly into Madoff investment securities. They would instead invest in middlemen called feeder funds. These feeder funds in turn invest in Madoff's fund. So why use feeder funds? Feeder funds are relatively common in the money management business. A hedge fund that manages billions of dollars might only have a few dozen employees. They don't have the administrative capacity to have thousands of investors, so they often require very high investment minimums in the millions of dollars. The problem is, there aren't very many people with this much money. Feeder funds specialize in onboarding large numbers of end clients, and have much smaller investment minimums. Once they raise capital from a large number of people, the feeder fund as a whole has enough money to invest in the hedge fund. While there are legitimate reasons to use feeder funds, Madoff also has some less than legitimate reasons. As you probably know, Madoff's investment business was a total sham, and there were no actual trades happening. As Madoff's fund grew, this would eventually cause a problem. The options exchanges disclose the volume of trades to the public. The trades are anonymized, so you can't see who is making the trades. You can only see the total number of trades executed. Eventually, Madoff's fund became so big as to be numerically impossible. At the peak, it reached $50 billion of assets under management. At this point, they would have to buy tens of billions of dollars worth of options every single month. This would be greater than the entire volume reported on the exchanges at the time. If you look at a list of Madoff's largest investors, they were almost all investment companies or banks. They weren't investing with their own money. They were feeder funds acting as middlemen. With Madoff's investments spread out across dozens of feeder funds, it was very difficult for an outside observer to figure out Madoff's total AUM. Furthermore, people who invested in these feeder funds often didn't even know they were ultimately investing with Madoff. Let's take the example of the Fairfield Century Fund. This was the single largest feeder fund which ultimately raised $7.5 billion. This is a marketing document distributed to prospective investors in 2002. They explain that they chose 30-35 to 35 stocks within the S&P 100 index. They then sell calls and buy puts, the options caller strategy we talked about previously. The main selling point of the fund is that it's hedged. The put options provide downside protection. By this point, the fund had been in operation for 13 years, or 156 months. Of these 156 months, the fund suffered a decrease in value in only 5 of them. So in 97% of the months, the fund has a gain, and in 3% of the months it has a loss. If we look at the options caller strategy they claim to employ, we can immediately see that their track record was absurd. The put option indeed protects you from suffering a large loss, but it does not decrease the probability of suffering any loss. For example, let's say the strike price of the put is 5% below the current stock price. If the stock falls by 10% this month, you exercise the put option, so your loss is capped at 5%. But you still made a loss, it would still be a down month. They also include a chart of their supposed returns compared to the S&P 500. Between 2000 and 2002, the S&P 500 suffered a severe bear market as the dot-com bubble crashed. Yet during this period, the Century Fund continued to increase steadily. According to their own prospectus, they claimed to invest in 30-35 to 35 S&P 100 stocks most correlated to that index. The S&P 100 is a subset of the S&P 500, and it suffered a similar bear market during this period. Given Fairfield's use of put options, you'd expect them to outperform in a bear market, as in, they would suffer a smaller drawdown compared to the index. But it makes zero sense that they would continue to post positive returns. Remember, Fairfield was a feeder fund. They didn't do any trading themselves, they just invested into Madoff's fund. Yet Madoff was not mentioned a single time in this prospectus. Fairfield just gave a vague disclosure that they selectively identify external managers for exclusive affiliations, where they serve as a comprehensive marketing and distribution partner. In hindsight, the returns were clearly too good to be true. 
But even as early as 1991, McKinsey and company already felt that something was off. At the time, they were investing in Madoff's fund directly, not through a feeder fund. They hired the former professor, professional gambler, and hedge fund manager, Edward Thorpe. Just by looking at the returns, he suspected they were too good to be true. But this wasn't good enough. He needed to find a smoking gun. At the time, Madoff Investment Securities mailed a statement with trade confirmation to their clients. Thorpe reviewed these trades. He concluded that half of the trades never occurred on any exchange at the prices and times that the document claimed. For another quarter of the trades, the total volume across all the exchanges was less than the number of options that Madoff claimed to have traded. It was therefore impossible for all of these trades to be legit. The last quarter of the trades theoretically could have happened. Thorpe wanted to see if at least these were real, so he talked to a contact that he had at Bear Stearns, one of the largest investment banks at the time. Bear Stearns acted as a middleman for huge amounts of options trades. If Madoff was making these trades, Bear Stearns would know. Even if Madoff didn't use Bear Stearns as a counterparty directly, Bear Stearns had a pretty good idea of who was trading in the market. But they couldn't find any record of Madoff buying or selling a single options contract. But the fake trades alone weren't enough to generate the consistently positive trades that Madoff was reporting. If the stock market was down in a given month, Madoff's supposed trades would generate a loss. In such months, he would also put on a short position on the S&P 100 index. The profits from this short sale would offset the losses from the core investment strategy. Similarly, in months when the returns were higher than usual, Madoff would also put on a short position in the S&P 100. This would smooth out the returns, making them consistent month after month. Madoff was meticulous with his fake trades. If you had a time machine and made every trade that Madoff claimed to have made, you would have indeed achieved those returns. The problem is, it requires selectively taking short positions only when the market goes down. Thorpe reported his findings to McKinsey. He had found a smoking gun, proving definitively that Madoff was a fraud. McKinsey reluctantly heeded Thorpe's advice and withdrew their money from the fund, despite it being their best performing investment. Thorpe asked around his wealthy acquaintances, asking if any of them knew anything about Madoff. A few of them were indeed investors in Madoff's fund. But Madoff told his investors they weren't allowed to talk about the fund to other people. If they did, he would kick them out as investors. This secrecy made it very difficult to figure out how much money Madoff was managing in total. At the time, Madoff was still the chairman of the National Association of Securities Dealers. He was very well respected, and few people took Thorpe's allegations seriously. All the while, the feeder funds were having a field day. Investment firms and banks across the US and Europe raised tens of billions of dollars from their high net worth clients to funnel it into Madoff investment securities. All the while, they were collecting hundreds of millions of dollars in fees. The feeder funds didn't ask too many questions, as this could jeopardize their cash flow. All the while, Madoff was spending hundreds of millions of dollars to fund his lavish lifestyle, including luxury homes in New York and Florida, yachts, and a multi-million dollar art collection. In 2000, a financial analyst named Harry Markopoulos also concluded that Madoff's returns were too good to be true, and must be fraudulent. Markopoulos was working completely independently of Edward Thorpe. He reported his findings to the SEC multiple times, but they failed to conduct a serious investigation. It wasn't until 2008, 17 years after Edward Thorpe found him out, and 8 years after Harry Markopoulos, that Madoff was finally arrested. And his arrest was not the result of any investigation. In 2008, a large proportion of his end clients started withdrawing their funds. Madoff knew that he didn't have the money to make good on these withdrawals. Knowing it was game over, he confessed to his two adult sons, who immediately went to the police. When the police came to his house, Madoff immediately confessed his crimes. The case of Bernie Madoff shows how far a reputation can take you. Madoff spent decades building up his reputation with his legitimate market-making business. When he launched his massively successful investment fund, very few people were brave enough to say what many of them privately knew. The emperor was wearing no clothes. Alright guys, that wraps it up for this video. What do you think about the Madoff case? Let us know in the comments section below. As always, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Wall Street Millennial, signing out.